Welcome to The Word Unveiled, our continuing series of programs on our faith. Tonight, our program is on David, a man after God's own heart. So let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grant us, Lord, the lamp of charity, which never fails, that it may burn in us and shed its light on those around us, and that by its brightness we may have a vision of that holy city where dwells the true and never-failing light, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, David, a man after God's own heart, and what that means for us. So there are several ways to interpret scripture. The first is the literal sense. Uh, that means you read what it says, and that's what it means. But there is also three spiritual senses, and that's the allegorical sense. What does it mean? sound like? What is it referring to? Uh, the moral sense, what is the teaching there? In the anagogical sense, what is the end times message that one can interpret from that text? So our program now is part two. This is the second of six programs, and the title is Crowns and Responsibilities. So we'll begin with Saul's story. So Mark Twain once said, History does not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And we'll see why in a moment. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. In his old age, Samuel appointed his sons judges over Israel. His firstborn was named Joel, his second Abijah, and they, were, they judged at Beersheba. His sons did not follow his example, but looked to their own gain, accepting bribes and perverting justice. Therefore, all the elders of Israel assembled and went to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Now that you are old and your sons do not follow your example, appoint a king over us, like all the nations to rule us. So if we remember Eli and his two sons, they were quite rebellious and blasphemed God by very uh, bad conduct. And now it turns out the good judge, Samuel, has two sons that are similar. So Samuel was displeased when they said, give us a king to rule over us, but he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, listen to whatever the people say. You are not the one they are rejecting. They are rejecting me as their king. They are acting toward you just as they have acted from the day I brought them up from Egypt to this very day, deserting me to serve other gods. Now listen to them but at the same time give them a solemn warning and inform them of the rights of the king who will rule them. So Samuel delivered the message of the Lord in full to those who were asking him for a king. And he told them, the governance of the king who will rule over you will be as follows. He will take your sons and assign them to his chariots and horses, and they will run before his chariot. He will appoint from among them his commanders of thousands and of hundreds. He will make them do his plowing and harvesting and producing his weapons of war and chariotry. He will use your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his servants. He will tithe your crops and grape harvests to give to his officials and his servants. He will take your male and female slaves, as well as your best oxen and donkeys, and use them to do his work. He will also tithe your flocks. As for you, you will become his slaves. On that day, you will cry out because the king whom you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. The people, however, refused to listen to Samuel's warning and said, no, there must be a king over us. We, too, must be like all the nations with a king to rule us, lead us in warfare, and fight our battles. So Samuel listened to all the concerns of the people and then repeated them to the Lord. And the Lord said, listen to them, appoint a king to rule over them. And then Samuel said to the people of Israel, return each one of you to your own city. Well, like a child who has to learn a lesson the hard way, the Lord now allows Israel to put their trust in a human king and once again reject the Lord who loves them. How many times have they done this? It's sinful people rejected the Lord in their passage over the Sinai. Well, at the same time, there was a man 
named Kish, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the smallest of the, of the tribes. And his donkeys had run off and they were lost. So he sent his son Saul with a servant to go and look for them. And they looked everywhere for several days. And they were about to go back home in frustration. And at that moment, the servant thought of the seer of Israel who lived nearby. The seer was, of course, Samuel. So as they were going up the path to the city, they met some young women coming out to draw water, and they asked them, is the seer in town? And the young women answered, yes, there, straight ahead. Hurry now, just today he came to the city, because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. And when you enter the city, you may reach him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not eat until he arrives. Only after he blesses the sacrifice will the invited guests eat. Go up immediately, for you should find him right now. So they went up to the city, and as they entered it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way to the high place. The day before Saul's arrival, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, At this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, whom you are to anoint as ruler of my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people their cry has come to me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord assured him, this is the man I told you about. He shall govern my people. So Samuel informs Saul of the Lord's decision, and he anoints him to be the king of Israel and sends him to Mizpah to be presented to the nation. Well, soon after, the Ammonites besieged the city of Jabesh. Now, the Ammonites live on the East, east of Israel, they live in a, an area that would be northern Jordan, southern Syria, and they, they attacked the city of Jabesh, and their inhabitants sent out messengers asking for help from all the other Israelites. Well, King Saul, the new King Saul, hears of this, and he takes a team of oxen and he sacrifices them, asking the Lord for strength in this rescue effort. He also asks who will follow him. So note, he, he talks to the Lord first before he acts. He leads an attack at dawn that decimates the Ammonite camp, and he rescues the city of Jabesh. And so he becomes a hero of the entire nation. And they all go to Gilgal and make Saul their king and the Lord's presence. And Samuel speaks to the people. Now, why would they go to Gilgal? Gilgal, you have to remember, is the place where the Israelites, when they first came with Joshua, they crossed into the Promised Land, crossing the Jordan River at Gilgal, and they piled up rocks to make a monument there for all their nations. So they go back to the beginning, and there they declare that Saul is going to be their king. And in 1 Samuel chapter 12, we read, If you fear and serve the Lord, if you listen to the voice of the Lord, And do not rebel against the Lord's command. If both you and the king who rules over you follow the Lord your God, well and good. But if you do not listen, the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. So that's a little bit ominous. So despite receiving a king, Samuel points out the wickedness of the people in asking for a king. So he reminds them, this was not the Lord's intention, but you have asked for it. Well, suddenly it rains in a time that when rain does not occur uh, to underscore the offense. So the people are frightened when this occurs. I kind of have an idea what they're talking about because I did some some work in Jordan many years ago, and Jordan only gets like 2.1 inches of rain a year. And one day when I was there, it rained 1.2 inches. Everything was flooded. It was it was quite uh, quite startling. So the people are given this sign that something has happened. So Samuel then states that he will not compound his own sins by not praying for the people, so that they will know that the Lord has not abandoned them. But they must show their love of the Lord and his law in their future actions. So Samuel is going to continue to be in communion with God. He's just warning the people that they need to continue to do that. And in chapter 12, verse 23, he says, As for me, far be it from me to sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you and to teach you the good and right way. But you must fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for you have seen the great things the Lord has done among you. If instead you continue to do evil, both you and your king 
shall be swept away. So Saul sets out to drive the Philistines out of positions near the borderlands. He's already met the Ammonites. Now he goes after the Philistines. And Samuel will come and offer sacrifice and pray to the Lord for each and every one of these occasions. And Samuel does not arrive when expected one time. So Saul impatiently orders a sacrifice of burnt offerings. And that's a no-no. So Samuel asks him, what have you done? And Saul explained, when I saw that the army was deserting me and you did not come on the appointed day and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I said to myself, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not yet sought the Lord's blessing. So I thought I should sacrifice the burnt offering. And Samuel replied to Saul, you have acted foolishly. Had you kept the command the Lord your God gave you, the Lord would now establish your kingship in Israel forever. But now your kingship shall not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart to appoint as ruler over his people because you did not observe what the Lord commanded you. So raiders from the Philistines, they invade Israel and they kill or capture all the blacksmiths. Interesting. So that Israel lacks swords and spears. So they get a technological advantage over them. And Jonathan, who is the son of King Saul, he achieves some small victories. And Saul and the main army, they join in battle. And King Saul finally declares that nobody should eat until the Philistines are totally routed under pain of death. Well, his son Jonathan is unaware of this oath, and he sticks his sword in a honeycomb and he eats it in front of everybody. And this then becomes known to Saul. So Saul's caught up in his own senseless oaths, and now he declares that the people should decide if Jonathan should live or die. Well, fortunately, the people choose life for Jonathan, and this simply shows that Saul needs to rein in his wild habits because oaths without forethought prove senseless and dangerous. So here's a a map of the area. We see that the tribes of Israel are uh, surrounded by uh, Canaanite peoples. And then we read in 1 Samuel chapter 14 that after taking possession of the kingship over Israel, Saul waged war on its enemies all around. He waged war against the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. And wherever he turned for a while, he was successful. So Samuel said to Saul, it was I, the Lord, sent to you, sent to anoint your king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the message of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish what Amalek did to the Israelites when he barred their way as they came up from Egypt. And that's in the time of Moses. He says, now go now and attack Amalek and put under the ban everything he has. Do not spare him, kill men and women children and infants, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. That's pretty fierce. How do we read this passage? Well, Irenaeus, who is a father of the church, says that we have to understand a historical evolution of this teaching, that it may not have meant exactly what it meant. And Origen talks about the allegorical sense of scripture. And what it basically says is, If you're you're killing out all of these people, what you're doing is you're killing out the influence that they have in corrupting your nation. So, And we know that the Israelites were corrupted by contact with the Canaanites. So we have to to think about what this means. So what it says in Scripture is that Saul attacked the land of the Amalekites, but he doesn't destroy everything or everyone. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9, we read, He and his troops spared King Agag and the best of the fat sheep and oxen and the lambs. They refused to put under the ban anything that was worthwhile, destroying only what was worthless and of no account. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret having made Saul king, for he has turned from me and has not kept my command. At this, Samuel grew angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, he went to meet Saul but he was informed that Saul had gone to Carmel and where, where he set up a monument in his own honor and that on his return, he had gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul greeted him. 
the Lord bless you. I have kept the command of the Lord. But Samuel asked, what then is the bleeding of sheep that comes to my ears, the lowing of oxen that I hear? And Samuel then said, though little in your own eyes, are you not chief of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king of Israel and sent you on a mission saying, go and put the sinful Amalekites under a ban of destruction. Fight against them until you have exterminated them. Why then have you disobeyed the Lord? You have pounced on the spoil, thus doing what was evil in the Lord's sight. And Saul explained to Samuel, I did indeed obey the Lord and fulfill the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and carrying out the ban, I have destroyed the Amalekites. But from the spoil, the army took sheep and oxygen, <laughs> oxen, the best of what had been banned, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So he kind of tries to make a story out of this that they're going to sacrifice all these animals when in reality they were dividing them up for their own gain. And afterwards, Samuel commanded, bring Agag, king of Amalek, to me. And Agag came to him struggling and saying, so it is bitter death. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And then he cut Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel departed from Ramah while Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of, of Saul. And never again, as long as he lived, did Samuel see Saul. And yet he grieved over Saul because the Lord repented that he had made him king of Israel. Well, a post, uh, a sub note to this uh, story is that the wife of King Agag survives and escapes. And one of her descendants is a man named Haman who plots genocide against the Jews when they're in exile in Persia. You can read about that in the book of Esther. Now, many scripture scholars tell us that we must read all through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus instructs, chastises, and forgives. So all scripture is for teaching. The allegorical sense of reading scripture tells us that we need to understand the underlying message. The, the Amalekites are defined as wicked people. When Saul retains a little of the Amalekite possessions, it's like retaining a little of the attraction to sin that enslaves us. So Saul was obedient, except for Agag and a few sheep. That's like saying you're honest in all your dealings 90% of the time. So while these vicious acts of war and plunder probably happened, it's unlikely that all the Amalekites were put to death or even that the Lord intended that. It is sin that the Lord cannot look upon. Obedience to the Lord is the message. And Samuel underscores that with Agag. Now in chapter 16, we read, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve for Saul, whom I have rejected as king of Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for from among his sons I have decided on a king. But Samuel replied, How can I go? Saul will hear of it and kill me. And to this the Lord answered, Take a heifer along and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I myself will tell you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I point out to you. Well, there's a little background story we need to go into here. And it begins with a woman named Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons, Malan and Chilion. And they live in the region of Bethlehem. And, but because there's famine in the land, they decide to leave and go into the land of the Moabites. Well, Elimelech dies, that's the husband, and Malon and Chilion uh, marry Moabite women. Malon's wife is Ruth, and Chilion marries Orpah. And both husbands soon die also. So Naomi told, tells her daughters, or her daughters-in-law, that she's going to return to Israel. Go and find new husbands among your own people, she tells Ruth and Orpah. But neither girl wants to desert their mother-in-law. But Naomi insists, and Orpah finally complies. But Ruth refuses and stays with Naomi, and she occupies her, or, or, or she accompanies her, rather, all the way back to Israel. And Naomi despairs of ever having grandchildren. Now, in Bethlehem, 
Naomi tells Ruth to glean in the fields of her kinsman Boaz. To glean means that the Israelites had a rule that poor people could go into the fields after the harvest had taken place, and if anything remained there, they could take what was left and and feed upon that. Legally, it was theirs. And so she's gleaning in the fields of Boaz. And one evening, Ruth stays in the fields at night, and she reveals to Boaz who she is and her relationship to Naomi. And Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife. Ruth gives birth to a son, Obed, and Naomi has a grandchild. So Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. So a Moabite woman is the great-grandmother of the future King David. In this, the Lord reveals that salvation is for all peoples. Let's go on to David's story. This is about David, and we've finally gotten to David at this point. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 4. Samuel did as the Lord had commanded him. And when he entered Bethlehem, the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and asked, Is your visit peaceful, O seer? And he replied, Yes, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So purify yourselves and celebrate with me today. He also had Jesse and his sons purify themselves and invited them to the sacrifice. And as they came, he looked at Eliah and he thought, Surely the anointed one is here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. God does not see as a mortal who sees the appearance. God looks into the heart. In the same way, Jesse presented seven sons before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any one of these. And then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? And Jesse replied, There is still the youngest, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send for him. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse had the young man brought to them. He was ruddy, a youth with beautiful eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, There, anoint him, for this is the one. And then Samuel, with the horn of oil in hand, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. So for reflection, we consider Saul. Are we ever like Saul, more conscious of our own reputation and seek credit for great deeds instead of acting with humility and trusting in the plan of the Lord? Do we sometimes believe that our achievements must be acknowledged and that others are in competition for us or with us for whatever we perceive to be the glory? Are we always measuring ourselves against others? Do we bend the rules when we believe we have a better idea? Like Sam, like Saul when he decided to take over the sacrifice and couldn't wait for Samuel? Are we likely to keep the sheep even against the Lord's instructions? Do we make empty oaths? Do we hear what the Lord says to us, but decide, no, I'm going to do it my way? Well, that was what Saul did. And then Samuel, let's think about him for a moment. Do we, like Samuel, pray for those who repeatedly ignore the warnings of the Lord? Remember, he said he would continue to pray for the people, even though he thought they were doing a great wrong. Do we continue in service to the Lord in spite of significant setbacks? Do we trust the Lord in all things? This can be very tough sometimes. Do we carry out the Lord's plan when others, in fact, the majority around us, do not? And are we unshaking, unshaken when facing overwhelming opposition? So let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.